speaker today, Roberta Rocca, who um, is on the fourth floor and has been over at Lix, so I'm assuming most of you know. Um, but in the off chance that you don't, uh, Roberta has a, a background in philosophy. Oh, to start there, <laughs> right? That's, that's where we start. <laughs> I'm trying to hide this. But, uh, yeah. No, I'm not going to not gonna let you do that. <laughs> uh, but probably more relevantly, a PhD in cognitive neuroscience with a focus on um, the semantics of spatial demonstratives. Uh, which then led to a broadening out at uh, UT Austin doing machine learning on, um, on neuroimaging data um, and more recently an internship with the UN and increasingly research in more applied topics um, including um, focus on European identity and lots of other interesting things that are going to come up today. Um, so increasingly moving in sort of the direction of large language models and NLP, Roberta seems to be able to span a very broad range of um, methods and topics. Um, um, within experimentation and data analysis and sort of nudging her more in the direction of theory. <laughs> <laughs> um, see how that goes. Um, but um, today we'll see um, how all of this comes together in this project, modelling individual traits using large language models. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Josh. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, just as a disclaimer, there's going to be very low theory uh, today. Uh, so um, what I'm going to be talking about today are three studies um, that are sort of related um, in sort of two main respects. One is methods. Uh, most of these studies make use of large language models and especially transformers, but not only. Um, and they're also related um, in terms of content. So what these studies have in common is that they're, they try to look into ways in which we can use large language models to predict traits, uh, individual traits, when they're not known. Um, when I talk about individual traits, I'm sort of using a very, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of um, referring to something very general. Um, you can think about it in terms of any sort of stable attribute of individuals. The first of these studies is going to look into, let's say, clinical traits. Uh, the last of these three studies is going to look into more uh, social or political traits of individuals. And in the middle, there's going to be a more methods-oriented study looking into how we can improve existing language models to sort of push them more into the re direction of uh, encoding individual traits. Um, this sounds very abstract, so let's maybe try to start from something concrete. If I can move to the next slide, that is, and I cannot. Sorry about this. Okay, so here's two tweets. Um, take a couple of minutes, read through them, and try to guess which one of them is produced by a U.S. Democratic senator uh, versus a U.S. Republican senator. Whenever you have a guess, just say something. The first one's from a Republican. Good, great job. <laughs> <laughs> I see your domain expertise helped yeah. you, uh, yeah. but can you s say a bit more about why? Um, or what, what in the text actually brought you to, led you to this conclusion? In secure borders is a yeah. typical talking point uh, yeah. about a hardline immigration stance, um, yeah, uh, economic yeah. focus. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay. thanks. Uh, I know this is very, very trivial uh, for some of you, uh, but the main point here is that by just reading these tweets and sort of understanding the content of these tweets, you're able to draw inferences about something, some information about the person who's produced them. Now let's try something maybe harder. These two tweets have the same topic in common. Um, can you guess which one is produced by a former US president versus the current US president? <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna guess that's tweet number two. Former oh, US president. Former okay. president. Yeah. Yeah. okay, good, right, so. Um, any more details about how sort of we could say the topic is roughly the same, but there's maybe some difference in the style, right? Uh, it's shorter. Um, yeah, it sort of has a different vibe to it, let's say, right? So I know this is a very sort of trivial, very high level intro to the talk, but this is just to convey the point that by just reading some text, we're able to make inferences about the person who's written them. Um, maybe we could also, if we look at the previous one, we could also try to make some guesses about, okay, what's the gender of the person who's produced these tweets? Uh, we may be wrong. We may be applying some very sort of 
rough biases to, to make this kind of inference, but there's definitely ways in which we can try to predict some information about the person who produces this kind of text. So this is what I mean when I talk about trying to predict individual traits uh, through linguistic behavior. So there's something about, some information about the person who's produced a given piece of text that sort of makes itself apparent or manifest in, in the content or the style of uh, the text that has been produced. When I talk about traits, um, again, I mentioned it's something that encompasses sort of several categories. Uh, there's studies showing that demographics can be inferred from the text. Um, personality uh, information can also be um, sort of inferred from um, the content of what someone writes about, potentially also the style. Uh, there are studies looking at specific clinical conditions and showing that clinical conditions have an impact in the kind of language which we produce. And there's also studies looking at, for example, political affiliation, which is closer to the examples I, I showed before. Uh, when I talk about features of linguistic behavior that express these traits, again, it's, it can be very different categories of things. Uh, there's something about content, so what we actually talk about, but you could also look at features of the style of the person who's writing if we're okay making this very sort of high level distinction. When I talk about styles, you can think about dialects or social dialects. You could think about the complexity of a given utterance. You can convey the same message with very different levels of syntactic complexity, for example. You can look at lexical choices, talking about the same things with different words. And you can look at narrative styles, for example. These are just some examples of features that could describe individual differences in linguistic behavior. Of course, not everything we produce is sort of deterministically generated on the basis of our traits, there's definitely some degree of arbitrary variation in there. This is not a new thing um, in research. Uh, there's a lot of studies that have tried to map uh, specific traits of interest uh, to given markers in linguistic behavior. But the overwhelming majority of the literature focuses on this problem from one specific angle, namely trying to identify a number of like candidate markers of a given trait and then trying to map them onto that marker. You could say that on the basis of a distinction that has been sort of, is becoming increasingly important in the literature, this is an approach that's mostly based on explanation or mostly aims at sort of finding explanatory patterns in the data, but you could also flip this question and think about it in terms of prediction. Uh, what are these, uh, the advantages of this kind of approach? The advantages is that they're simple, uh, so you definitely know what you're looking for, uh, another advantage is that they're interpretable, so once you find an association, you feel like you know what you're talking about, uh, what kind of relations you've discovered in the data, but there's some downsides. So in some case, let's assume that we found, uh, we found reliable associations between how many function words a given person uses and, I don't know, a clinical condition, right? Is this enough to predict whether that person has a clinical, that condition or not? Uh, so this is something that it's not guaranteed by finding statistical associations between uh, variables. Um, another downside is that, again, let's assume that you, de you develop a great model that finds these associations. Can you take this model and reuse it for a different trait that's somewhat related, uh, but not entirely the same? And another question, which is dear to some of these people, other people in the room, is even if you're able to do this, so actually predict something that's similar to the outcome you're looking for, but maybe slightly different, um, how can you be sure that you're not, not overfitting, for example, to specific types of discourse that you're looking for, right? So you try, you find this association in people's diaries or journals, uh, and then you try to predict this information based on people's tweets. Is this gonna work? Probably not. So the question and the approach I'm gonna focus on in this talk is trying to sort of flip this question and think about it in a different and more general way in order to produce tools that are more scalable and hopefully more reliable, reliable when you think about applying them in the real world. And the question we're gonna ask is, can we train models that produce general representation of an individual based on the text that that individual has produced and that can be reused once trained on some uh, task to predict not just one, but multiple traits about that individual. Um, a little bit of a detour before we get into the studies. Um, the type of model I'm gonna be talking a lot about is transformers. And transformers are um, sort of becoming the, yeah, sort of the single tool that people use in NLP. Uh, there's some good reasons to it. One of the reasons is that one of the beauty, uh, beautiful aspects of transformers is that it can take an input, 
a given sentence or a sequence of text and return representations of that text at different levels. So you can get both representations at the level of tokens and representations at the level of whole sequences. So it's a, you could say it's a multi-level uh, tool. Um, one other interesting aspect of it is that previous models kind of exclusively focused on some aspects of linguistic behavior, some focus on semantics, like the meaning of words, some focus on syntactic representations. Transformers have a mechanism called self-attention that allows the model to learn representations that take into account the relations between words in a sentence. So in a way, it's about the semantics of words, but it's also about semantics in context and therefore syntactic relations, for example. And then there's the third point I'm highlighting here. It's probably the most important of all. Namely, you can train these models on, you can use pre-trained models that have been trained on a lot of text using some very general language task like predict the next word. And you can just fine tune very small parts of these models to perform any task that you can frame in terms of a predictive task, for example, a classification task or a regression task. So this is a principle called transfer learning, and that's really the power of these models. You can just take pre-trained models from a given repository, fine tune some parts of them, and adapt them to the, yeah, the kind of task you're trying to perform without having to spend the kind of computational power that Google has to spend on pre-training this model. So this is one of the beautiful things about them. As we'll see, this works very well in some context. It doesn't always work. So it's not just a guarantee for a success. Okay, the three studies I'm going to be talking about um, sort of tackle these problems from three different perspectives. The first one is a study that looks at applications of these principles in a clinical setting or for a task that could potentially be used in clinical settings. So if we use these models, can we, uh, for example, transform models and compare them to performance of traditional machine learning models? Can we predict clinically relevant attributes of a given person based on text. And the idea is that, well, if we can do it, that's great. If we can scale this to predicting traits or more tr transient uh, characteristics of people, that is something that could be very helpful in a clinical setting. The second study uh, conceptually follows from the first one. Okay, we'll find out that we can do it to some extent, but it's not great. And there's definitely ways in which we can improve performance of our models. One of the ways is thinking about using better models as starting point. So how can we actually think about pre-training models uh, that are better starting points for individual trait research? Um, and when I talk about better methods, I think, I'm, I'm thinking about something that can do it more accurately, of course, but also more efficiently. So without having sort of potentially having to train our final model less. And I'm also thinking about low resource context. So context like clinical settings where you're not gonna have data from 30,000 participants, you're probably going to have data from 10, I don't know, dozens or hundreds of participants. And then the third study is just, it's just going to be a very broad overview of applications of the same principles in a political science setting. So uh, what we're going to be looking at there is, can we predict different uh, markers of political identity? And when I talk about political identity, I mean people's feeling of national and transnational belonging based on what they write. Let's start from the first study. I probably got the affiliations wrong, but this is a study uh, I've been working on with Lasse and Ricardo over there. Um, it's a fun study where we try to figure out if we can predict clinical diagnosis from language that people have produced in the context of a cognitive task. Uh, we focus on different contrasts um, between uh, three dimensions mainly. One is how well can we predict clinical diagnosis based on text, so transcriptions of what people have said. Uh, versus audio, so not transcriptions, but the speech signal. Uh, the second contrast is looking at traditional feature-based approaches, so actually taking, for example, text, turning it into some uh, semantic representation, for example, and feeding it to a classifier, versus using transformers, so skipping the sort of make, having to make decisions on how we turn text into features and just feeding the text to a transformer, fine-tuning the transformers, and see how, how these models do. And most importantly, the third contrast is uh, a contrast between looking at predicting di diagnosis in a binary setting, so just trying to predict whether a person has a given diagnosis, say, major depressive disorder, versus predicting whether that person is a control. This is the way these kind of problems are generally framed in the literature, uh, but these are not really good sort of ways to mimic 
naturalistic decision making in this domain, right? So when you see, when you when you talk to a patient, you're probably gonna have to figure out not simply if that person has depression or not, but what diagnosis among a range of possibilities does that person have? So what happens if we take these problems and stay, scale them to multi-class settings? So instead of having to predict control versus something else, we predict control versus three different diagnoses. Some information about the task. Uh, so we're working with data from a few hundred participants. Uh, there's three clinical groups, ASD, major depressive disorder, and schizophrenia, and we have match controls for each of the groups. Uh, participants are uh, performing, when I, when I mention the cognitive task participant performing is something that some of you may be familiar with, and that is retelling what's happening in videos showing triangles doing something. So it's the animated triangles task. Uh, here I'm only showing two conditions, but there's three, as far as I remember. Uh, in one of them, triangles are just like drifting randomly. In the other one, they're moving in sync. In the third condition that's not shown here, they sort of seem to be doing something together. So there's some degree of intentionality there. So participants see these videos and they retell them. Uh, and what we're working with is transcripts of um, these retellings on one hand, and uh, the speech signal, so auditory signal, so the actual recordings, uh, in a sense. Cool. Uh, some information what we do. As I said, we, um, we use two approaches. One is sort of a traditional, a canonical machine learning pipeline. We take text, we turn it into features, we feed it to classifier. The other one is using transformers. So for the feature-based approaches, in the case of text, we take transcript from a given trial, we feed it to a feature extractor. It's gonna be different types of feature extractors. So here, just focus on the high level concept. We feed it to an extra boost classifier, which is a tree-based prediction model. Uh, then we get one prediction per transcript. So remember, there's a different trials, different conditions. So we have to pool the predictions from each of these transcripts to make, sort of, to extract one uh, prediction per participant. Uh, and this is the diagnosis uh, that we're predicting. Uh, we do a similar thing with audio, uh, again starting from an audio signal, feeding it to a feature extractor. In this case, the only difference is that we're windowing, it, windowing the, the audio file, and then we feed the resulting features to, in this case, this is a standard like shallow classifier, right, Leslie? Yes. Um, and then we pool the resulting predictions at the participant level, and we get one, diagnose, one predicted diagnosis per participant. Mm -hmm. We also try another approach, uh, a pipeline that takes into account both th signals. Uh, in this case, we're doing it in a very, you could say, sort of naive, simple way. Uh, we don't combine features from the two approaches, but we sort of let each of the pipelines do their own thing, produce predictions at the participant level, and then we pool predictions across audio and text. And that's where we get a diagnosis for each participant. The transformer-based pipeline is sort of the same kind of story, but simpler. Uh, so we skip the featureization pro uh, process because the transformer is gonna do that. Uh, for text, we use BERT-like models. Uh, we have Danish data, and so we're, we're gonna be using uh, data and uh, transformers trained in Danish or multilingual models that also have Danish in the training data. And for audio, we use uh, a wolf to back model, a multilingual wolf to back model. Um, yes, and it's the same story again for the ensemble pipeline. We let each of the pipelines do their own thing, produce predictions, and then we pull the predictions and, and get a diagnosis. Cool. One more bit of um, uh, methods. Um, I s mentioned that for feature extraction, we're using different uh, pipelines. We're actually fitting quite a few different models. There's one block of features uh, that are sort of simple descriptives, uh, sort of descriptives of, of uh, different characteristics of, of text. Some of them are very general descriptors, like the length of a sentence, the number of unique tokens, the number of sentences. Uh, then we have readability index, indices. Uh, we use measures of syntactic complexity and then sentiment. And uh, these are beautifully and simply extracted using these two libraries, tech descriptives, that's Lasse's library, and DACY, which is a library developed by CH CHCAA. Um, so uh, if you're using yeah, if you're working with NLP in Danish, these are wonderful resources to check out. Uh, for each of these, we fit both models using every single feature in isolation and models using all the features together. We also fit the back of words models. So these are basically, roughly speaking, frequency-based models that look at how often a given word in the vocabulary of Danish is used. Uh, we also use static embeddings, fast text embeddings. 
And then, as I mentioned, we have transformers, uh, and we use both uh, Danish-only models, so unilingual Danish models such as Electra, and multilingual uh, models uh, such as Candy Bird. For audio, uh, we have sort of three standard audio feature sets, uh, EG Maps, Compare, and MFCCs. Uh, and in terms of more complex deep learning pipelines, we use this X-Vector model developed by uh, SpeechBrain, which is a speaker recognition model. So it's a model that's pre-trained on predicting or taking a corpus of text and learning to identify who's speaking at a given time. And then we use the back model, which is on the other hand a speech recognition model. So something that takes audio as an input and tries to transcribe that input. And the checkpoint we're starting from is a multilingual model called XLSR, as far as I remember. Good, excellent. Cool. So what do we get? Let's start from the bigger picture. These are, for each of the groups, the five best models. Um, so let's start from binary performance. Binary performance is what we j just feed the model um, data from, for example, depressed patients and match controls, and we ask the model to predict uh, who's who, basically. And the kind of performance we get is very nice, especially with transformers for some diagnosis, depression, we get to 0.9 F1 score, which is great. Um, it's less great for ASD. This is actually a sort of a conservative dummy baseline that's just a model predicting control all the time. Um, and for schizophrenia, it seems like transformers are not helping that much. What happens if we look at multi-class performance? Uh, so these scores here for each diagnosis are basically the equivalent of binary scores, but in, in the multi-class setting. So we're just taking all the depressed patients and trying to see how often does the model correctly identify them compared to all controls in the data set. Um, so not just match controls. Um, as you can see, performance is quite a bit lower. Uh, it's definitely not something that you would, would want to use in any context where there's real consequences to what you're doing. Um, transformers help for some diagnosis. They don't for others. They're actually pretty detrimental for schizophrenia. And what happens when you look at overall performance, so just how well does the model do in predicting each individual class in a multi-class setting? Well, it's doing pretty well, considering that the task is hard, but it's definitely not comparable to binary performance. Um, so here we're talking about 0.5 uh, per, uh, F1 score for the best models. Um, this is not great. Um, it's OK, but it just tells you that um, the kind of models, the kind of problem that we're tackling when we look at binary prediction is not ideal if we want to think about generalization. So the models that we're training are not specifically picking up on mark are probably not specifically picking up of, on markers of a specific diagnosis, but they're just trying to distinguish, okay, does this person have a sort of normal pattern or not, potentially. Um, so, right, and here transformers are helping, not that much. Okay. Uh, this just zooms in uh, into the best uh, models we get in the multi-class setting and in the sort of overall prediction setting. The best model is an ensemble model, uh, which takes the two best baseline models. Here baseline just means the sort of traditional feature-based approaches. Uh, that's the best model we get. Uh, X-Vector is the second best. TF-IDF, simple, very simple TF-IDF model uh, does, even uh, well, does even better than any text transformer. And then we get all the sort of um, happy bunch of transformers after that. Uh, so with this data, in this context, transformers are not that helpful. Now you can ask, of course, as you can see, there's a lot of overfitting here. So the extent to which you want to trust this data is very limited. And then you may want to ask yourself questions like, OK, TF, simple TF-IDF models may be doing very well because it's picking up on specific words that are very relevant to this task. What happens if I take this model and take it and, and use it in a context where people are talking about something else? Is it going to work or is it going to be completely random? Um, what, so one of the interesting bits of information here is that the ensemble model does best. And this means that it's probably learning to pool useful information, useful distinct information that each of the audio and text models pick up on and then combine that in a useful way. And this is also something that you see if you look at confusion matrices, the error patterns of the two best baselines are actually fairly different. Um, so you can see, for example, the text model is great at predicting depression. The audio model kind of 
doesn't really work. It's sort of predicting half of them correctly and it's doing something else. So apparently pooling these models together is doing something good for predictive performance. One last bit of information before the conclusions. Uh, we have some data from uh, previous studies um, for in terms of binary performance and specific diagnosis. And what we can see is that the models that some of the models that we fit the, do almost as well as uh, studies from pre previous literature, which are these, all these gray ones. Uh, but it's kind of a little suspicious that all the data we find in the literature have these like stellar performance of like 0.9 F1. So there's definitely something um, yeah, to look into more carefully uh, out there. Cool, some conclusions. So we've learned that we can do pretty, we can do okay on multi-class classification, but it's definitely not something that you would really want to use in the real world. So what do we need to improve this? Uh, we definitely need more data and we need more varied data. And when I talk about more varied data, I mean data from multiple languages potentially, or even from multiple tasks within the same language. So there's some work that Alberto and Ricardo have done in the, in the past couple of years showing that models don't generalize that well, especially sort of, I think you're pretty much looking at traditional machine learning pipelines. They don't do that well when you take models trained on one task and you try to predict something, some uh, speech produced in a context of a different task. So this is something we need to look into if we want to think about applying these methods in the real world. Uh, we can think, we can improve the kind of predictive setup we're using. Um, so here we have multiple trials from the same participant, but we're only performing one, we're performing, we're asking the model to perform one prediction per uh, task, so per utterance, right? On the other hand, there's probably some interesting information that you can uh, extract or leverage if you use all the utterances from a given person in a model. The reason why you can do that is that models transform pipelines, for example, they have a limited length, so you need to think about smarter pooling mechanisms that you need to introduce in the model architecture if you want to do this. Um, we can also sort of in the long term, we can think about tasks that are more uh, useful than predicting diagnosis. This is something we can do as humans, but what we cannot do, for example, is trying to predict behavior or transient states. Uh, and this is a way we can scale these techniques to become something interesting and relevant uh, sort of from a societal point of view. And then there's a fourth thing that we can do, uh, which is the lead up to the next study, and it's something I'm especially interested in. Well, for transformers, we're starting from models that are pre-trained on general language tasks. So predict the next word, or in this case, predict a missing word in a sentence. Can we do something to, can we start from better uh, sort of starting models? Can we fine-tune models on tasks that are closer to what we want to do, but not specific uh, to the clinical domain. So the idea here is, can we take a large language model, think about a task which is sort of not using clinical data, and pre-train that, or further pre-train that model on that task, which pushes the model in a more interesting space uh, for us, and then use this data for clinical tasks. We're never gonna have enough data to train good generalizable models for clinical data, but can we do it in a smarter way? Can we use data that already exists to do something that's gonna have downstream benefits on clinical tasks? So this is what we try to do in uh, this second study. Uh, the second study is a study of um, is work I've been doing with Talia Coney at UT Austin. Um, and it looks into trying to use language models to develop uh, what we call a generalizable author encoder based on available data. So it's basically a model that, you've, that takes some text as an input and it outputs a representation of that text that encodes some relevant information about the author of that text. This could be used downstream to identify that author and this is probably something we don't want to have in some scenarios, but it could also be used to predict traits. Uh, and potentially it has applications in tasks that are relevant within the NLP community, such as so-called contextualized NLP. So the idea is task where you take a given standard representation of a sentence, you add the representation of a higher level piece of context, in this case the author, and you hope that the predictions that you're making, for example, classifying if that bit of text is irony or not, is going to be better if you add this information. Um, this paper is soon going to be published. Um, so. Yes, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> right, so what is the, why is this a challenging problem? Um, you want the model to learn something about the person who's produced that sentence. So 
you could think about this as, well, the closest task to it is I want to yeah, identify something specific about a person, so specific that I could know something about that person, right? Uh, but this is a very bad way of thinking about this problem from a machine learning perspective, because framed this way, it sounds like a classification task. I get a data set with text from Arnaud and Rebecca and Ricardo and me, and I want to teach them all to recognize who's produced what. Um, but the problem with this approach, apart from being dangerous downstream, is that as soon as I want to use the same model to predict whether Lina has produced a bit of text, this model is going to be completely clueless because it's never seen Lina in the data set, right? So if I fit to identity, this is going to be have zero chance of generalizing, not just at an empirical level, but at the conceptual level. It has no clue about what it has to do outside of the training set. So this is a really bad way of thinking about this problem. Luckily, it's a problem that has been, has sort of come up in fields and other fields uh, within machine learning. And that's exactly the same problem that you face uh, when you're thinking about some computer vision tasks, such as face recognition. Again, evil applications of this are, I want to train a system that sees you at the entrance of an airport and tells you this is Ricardo, right? Uh, but I can't do that because I don't have the training set for fitting to everyone in the world, or hopefully you don't. But you can think about this problem in a slightly different way. And the way this problem has been solved in computer vision is by coming up with a smart uh, so-called contrastive uh, training task, which works the following way. So the model is trained by feeding in a triplet of inputs. It's like three images of a given of three images of faces. Two of these images are selected such that they come from the same person, and these are called an anchor and a positive example. And the third image is a negative example, so a face of a different person. The model sees these images, it does something funny with this convolution neural network, it flattens the representation at the end, and you get some sort of vector representation of a given face. So now we have three vector representations. What does the model do? It computes the distance between the cosine distance or the Euclidean distance between these two representations and between these two. And the model is optimized for producing representations of these two, which are more similar than this one is to this one. So you're basically trying to optimize the model for producing representations that are closer in representational space if the faces come from the fa same person and they're further away in representational space if they come from different person, person people. Right, so this is the setup. Uh, the loss you use here is called triplet loss, uh, and this is the triplet. We just take this approach and translate it to um, an NLP setup. So what we do is that we feed the model with three bits of text, uh, an anchor, in this case, in some of the setups we use, it's actually multiple pieces of text as an anchor. We use a positive example, we take a negative example. In this case, the text, the, the corpus we're using, uh, the data that we're using for training is Reddit submissions. We just scraped all Reddit submissions from 2018 and 20, uh, to 2020. And this ends up being a data set that's, that sort of includes data from 1.7 million users and around 35 million posts. Uh, we feed this, um, this data to a, an encoder, a distal bird encoder in this case, so a small transformer model. We get some vector representation of all of this, and then we, these representations are basically positions of these posts in space, and that we optimize the models such that the distance between encodings of the anchor and of the positive example are closer than encodings of the anchor and the negative example. And then we compute the loss based on that, and we update the model. So same setup as face recognition, just applied to an NLP setting and with two different manipulations. So in one case, we only use one post as an anchor. In, an in another case, we use up to 10 posts from the same person as an anchor, and then we average these representations and then we see what happens. Okay, so what happens if we do this? Let's first look at performance uh, on this task, which is not terribly useful. Uh, it's just a way to sort of make sure that the model is learning something. So the scary thing here just basically means that we evaluate the model by saying that it's done correctly. So one, if for a given example, the distance between anchor and positive example is lower than the distance between anchor and negative example. And it scores zero, so it's not a poor job if it does the opposite. Uh, this is one epoch of training on the whole data set. And the model goes from a starting performance of around 0.60 something, 68 maybe, to 0.84-ish in one epoch of training. If you train more, it overfits, so we don't, don't do that. And this is when you use a single anchor. When you use multiple anchors, 
it starts from 0.70 something, it gets to around 0.93. So it's learning to do something. This is way better than the pre-trained model. It's also ba way better than any vanilla baseline, so feature-based baseline we could come up with. Okay, but this tells us it's doing good on this task. This is not necessarily use useful in other tasks. Uh, so let's take a step back and try to understand what is the model doing? Is it just trying to figure out if I'm using the word, I don't know, Denmark and trying to see if that word is in both posts and, and just overfitting to that, or is it doing something more complex? The way we try to infer that from the data is by looking at how the performance of the models change as a function of the length of a post. If you have longer posts, there are more chances that there's going to be some semantic overlap or some specific word being used as a marker of who you are uh, versus uh, sort of if that is if models performance is independent from length. And what we see is that when you use a single anchor, performance actually grows as the number of tokens in the anchor grows. So if you're training on a single post, it's sort of trying to cheat its way through the task. If you don't, uh, so if you've trained on multiple posts, model performance is pretty stable uh, across token lengths. So we interpret this as saying that the model being less sensitive to length means that it's not overfitting to specific markers, so hopefully it'll generalize better. How about uh, comparing whether the model is using, using semantics versus style? Uh, so we compare, um, we compare performance of the models for examples where the positive example comes from the same subreddit as the anchor to, to examples where this is not the case. So the idea is that a subreddit is basically a commun community based on a certain topic. Um, if the two posts come from the same community, they're probably going to be talking about similar things. Things, sort of posts taken from different subreddits are probably going to deal with uh, different topics. So you can see that uh, this is the model trained on one anchor, this is the model trained on 10, up, up to 10 anchors, and this is what we want to look at. So the fine tuned models, the one anchor, single anchor model is pretty sensitive to this, although not catastrophically, and still less than the pre trained model whereas the multi-anchor model doesn't really care uh, about overlap. So it's probably learning to find heuristics that are more robust. And finally, my favorite bit, what is the model actually learning? S can we try to find a way to figure out which words is the model paying attention to? Of course, we know that words are not everything. It's also probably fitting to sy syntax, but can we compare the kind of words that get most attention in the fine-tuned model versus words that get sort of, can we, identify words that take consistently take more attention in the fine-tuned models versus the pre-trained model. Uh, as you can see, the 10 anchor model comes up with a pretty interesting set of words, uh, very sort of psychologically intense. You have obsessed here, <laughs> desperately here, gambling here. There's, there's quite a lot of stuff here. Uh, yeah, so there, there's something interesting there. If you look at the one anchor model, there's nothing as crazy but there seem to be words, words that are somewhat, could somewhat be interpreted as markers of uh, demographics, for example. Uh, so something, some markers of gender, we have husband here, uh, and some markers of age, uh, and sort of a range of things that seem to sort of, could be indicators uh, or heuristics to find out which demographics does a person belong to. Of course, this is all storytelling. Uh, this is all like, we're finding some patterns and trying to interpret that, but it seems to show something different, and especially the differences between models are fairly exciting to me. And then, last bit of information about this study. Can we finally test if this is helpful in other tasks than just distinguishing these two bits of text and figuring out who's produced what? Um, the problem with this is that what you would ideally want to do is take this model and test if you can predict traits um, of the authors. But the data we use don't have labels for traits. So how can we build a task that is new, uh, but does not require labeled data? So what we do here is the following. We freeze the model. We put a classifier head on top of the model. And what we try to do is feed the model a post from a given user, Ricardo again. And then this post comes from, I don't know, a subreddit about football that Ricardo is notoriously interested in. <laughs> uh, and then we asked them all, does Ricardo also post in a subreddit about depression? So there's no relation between the subreddits. It's just all that has, all this has in common is the fact that it's Ricardo producing this. 
how well do the models do in these tasks for a range of different target subreddits compared to the pre-trained models. And the beautiful thing is that they do quite better, quite a lot better. So this is the best vanilla baseline performances for each of the target subreddits. This is the pre-trained model, so we, without we before we actually do anything, and this is the fine-tuned models, so our models after training. So you can see that classification performance goes up. It does not go up sort of like crazy, but it's also a pretty difficult task. And arguably, the pre-trained models also know something about sort of individual traits to start with. Uh, so. We, we explain this by saying that predictive performance in this task, or an increase in predictive performance in this task is motivated by models being able to infer something more interesting and deeper about that person and generalizing this to unknown behaviors. Um, yes, so that was it for this study. A couple of uh, pointers to limitations and next steps. One of the limitations, again, is that we don't have labeled data sets and there's no freely available uh, data sets where we could actually benchmark our model and predicting traits or behaviors for that matter. So this is something that definitely needs to be done to understand whether this approach is working or not. Um, if we, we could also hypothesize that this approach is actually improving the models for some NL general NLP benchmarks. I was mentioning irony detection, for example. It would be great to try it out. And then this model overfits wildly to Reddit text. So you can see that some of the some of the improve, uh, improvements in performance here are for subreddits that have to do with like video game preferences. We probably don't care too much about the model learning about pe whether people like Minecraft or, I don't know, uh, Crash Bandicoot or something like that. Cool. So last couple of minutes, this is going to be a very quick overview of uh, work that's in progress. So it's just going to be the conceptual infrastructure just to see that you can apply these tools to different domains. Uh, so I'm part of a project where we're trying to figure out what makes people feel like they belong to a country, what do they think about when they think about their country versus thinking about the European Union as a broader community. So what is it that sort of drives people's sense of attachment and belonging to different communities? And can we, if we have, can we try to do this and understand this by using text data? So can we ask people to tell us what they think about using some different ty types of tasks? and try to understand the conceptual framework that underlies identity in a political sense. And then the second question we want to ask is, okay, since we're collecting text data from these people, can we also predict to what extent they feel like they belong to a given community uh, at the national level versus the transnational level? Uh, this is a project I'm working on with a bunch of people. Uh, Katarina is one of the leading people in this project, and then Manos, Laura, Ali, and Andreas. Um, Right, so there's different studies in this project. Uh, I'm gonna be giving a very quick overview of the study that sort of is most relevant to tackling these questions. Um, we've, we're just, we've just finished collecting data for the first wave of a large scale survey where we're collecting data from between 1,300 and 1,500 people per country for Denmark, Italy, um, the UK, Poland, and Germany. Uh, this survey is more complex than this, so there's a lot of questions about policy preferences uh, in terms of, for example, immigration or sanctions related to Russia. There's a bunch of policy questions. There's some questions about political identity in the sense of like party affiliation. There's a bunch of questions about what people think the European Union is about. Uh, is it a political thing? Is it an economic thing? There's a, there's a range of questions that go beyond this. But these are the four blocks of questions which are most relevant to um, the, to the research questions I was presenting. So we're collecting people's demographics, uh, age, gender, income, background, employment, uh, where they come from, and what kind of direct experience of the EU they have. Have they traveled? Have they been on an exchange program? Have they actually lived abroad for extended periods of time? Things like that. Then we're asking them three identity questions, or five uh, identity questions. How proud are you of being a Danish citizen, for example, versus of being European citizen? How attached do you feel to Denmark versus to the European Union? And would you define yourself as a European, as a Dane, as a Dane and a European, a European and a Dane? None of those. Um, and then we asked them two sets of text-based questions. The first is a thought listing experiment. So we just asked people to tell us what are the three words that come to their mind when they think about their country and when they think about the European Union. Um, so we get three words per participant and participant are fairly compliant, so they actually uh, 
sort of produce useful information here. And then we go for a more open text question. In a few words, what do you think or feel towards the European Union? Um, and then this is a very bad proxy for a social media text, so trying to think about how you could apply uh, NLP models to social media text, looking at these things, because we don't have identity labels again for social media text. So this is just a building a data set to do these kind of things in a more naturalistic setting. Um, this is a pipeline that resembles very much the one I showed you before, but it's just to illustrate what we're doing. We're taking, so for the word uh, thought listing task, uh, we take words uh, that people produce in relation to their country or the EU, we vectorize them using standard uh, static word to vec models, uh, and then we're trying two approaches, one where we just keep the raw vectors, we feed this to a regression model, and we try to see how well this model does in predicting uh, identity scores. Um, and we do the same thing with dimensionality reduction. So we basically play, take the word vectors, we reduce dimensions, hoping that this compresses them into a space that is more relevant to this task and therefore more interpretable. Uh, we feed this to a tree-based regression, and then we both look at predictive performance, but also at feature importance for each of these, um, these dimensions. And then hopefully this will tell us, okay, what are the dimensions that are most predictive of whether people feel European or Danish or uh, both of those. Um, and then for the open text answers, we're only looking at prediction and we're trying to use, trans trying to see how this compares for, um, with um, transformer based approaches. So trying to predict identity based on what people say when they're asked, what do you think or feel about the European Union? And also possibly predict something more concrete, like do you think the European, there should be more non-European immigrants in the European Union, right? So poli policy related questions. And the idea is if you can do that to a reasonable extent, then we would try to apply these methods to uh, Twitter data we've collected from all these countries that um, include mentions of the European Union. Last slide, recap and what's next. Um, we've seen that large language models and sometimes also small language models are flexible and scalable methods that could, could help us um, encode or predict useful information about individuals. There's definitely some dystopian scenarios there. There's also some very good uh, sort of positive uh, societal scenarios. So predicting clinical traits at scale is something that we may want to do. Again, there's a potential sort of in the long, ter long term, there's potential for implementing these methods in society relevant domains. So think about trying to scale diagnostics to remote methods. So instead of having to go to a hospital physically, you could sort of have a do a pre-screening uh, over, over your phone or through an app. Uh, think about something more, even more interesting, so doing personalized monitoring. Let's say I want to predict how likely it is that you'll display a given symptom in the next 10 hours or something like that, right? So this is definitely something that's more useful, uh, also more challenging, and probably requires more sophisticated methods, but that's one of the scenarios that could be um, an interesting uh, real-world application for these methods. Uh, the last study, um, you could think about applying these to track public discourse and inform decision making. It's something that the whole project has been doing. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, there's NLP internal applications, for example, in contextualized NLP, which is also very exciting and very new field. Um, there is a lot of need for and room for uh, tech better technical resources. Uh, sort of one of the things I'm most um, interested in is the idea of trying to come up with smart uh, pre training methods that sort of can help us build a, a bunch of models that we can use in generalizable settings. Uh, so just like trade prediction models that are not specific to one field of application, but they sort of can be applied with some fine tuning, but less than would normally be required to predict specific traits. Um, and then one thing that's really missing is thinking about public benchmarks for applications that actually matter. So there is nothing public for clinical applications and there, there's very good reasons for it. Uh, but it's really hard to think, sort of, to assess how good your models are if you lack these kind of information. That was it. Thank you. I'll just show you one more thing. <laughs> this is what things think about when they think about that <laughs> one. And just that you. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs>